The book is Mastering Bitcoin. It was published December um, 11th. It came out on paper, um, immortalizing all of the mistakes of the first edition and fixing them in a printable hard medium. Uh, and, and to my eternal shame, this book is full of mistakes. Um, now, uh, if you're a programmer, you understand why that is. Right? We're dealing with software, and um, this is a moving target. Many things in Bitcoin change day to day. And so many of the things in this book were wrong the moment they were written. Some of the things in this book were correct at first, and then they became wrong over time. And so what I'd like to do is extend a challenge and an invitation to all of you. Find all of the mistakes in the book, and then do a pull request. Uh, GitHub, Bitcoin book. Uh, the entire thing is open source. It's available under a Creative Commons license. It's free to read. It's free to mash up. It's free to reuse. Um, you don't really need the Dead Trees edition. Uh, all this guarantees that it's already out of date by the time the first print happens. But I would love it if you could find these little mistakes and let me know and do a pull request. And in the spirit of open source, I will incorporate that and fix the mistakes. And the next edition is going to be printed. And as soon as it hits paper, it will be full of mistakes again. And then we repeat that process um, in a process of continual evolution and development. And software gets better over time, and bugs are shallow the more eyes that see them. Right? So this is the open source concept in a book. Um, O'Reilly, fortunately, is a publisher who is very comfortable with this concept, and they've been very supportive both in developing this in a community. Um, fashion, but also in uh, accepting changes. So um, I look forward to hearing if you can find all of the things that are wrong about this book. However, many things are correct in this book, and hopefully you will find uh, that it does give you some useful information. I've tried to make it accessible to um, all all types of people who are involved in Bitcoin. First two chapters are pretty readable for even for someone who's just a bit technically minded but not necessarily a developer you don't need to write a word of code in order to read the first couple of chapters it starts getting hairy after chapter 4 uh, it starts getting a bit more complex and um, hopefully you'll find that it conveys some good analogies on uh, some of the key structures in uh, bitcoin um, I was doing a, a book giveaway the other day, and um, wanted to do some kind of competition, ask a question, see who would get the right book. So I, I asked, there was a room full of people, I said, okay, who knows what a bloom filter is? Okay, who knows what a bloom filter is in here? Anyone? Okay, who knows what a Merkle tree is? Oh, fantastic. Okay, none of you need this book. So um, the people who didn't raise their hand get a free book. That's how I run the competition. Because after all, if you already know what these things are, you don't really need um, to read it. So um, I want to talk very briefly before we go. We're going to do a book signing. Everybody gets a book. I'll be happy to um, sign the book. Any dedication you want. If you just come up and don't say anything, the default will be to the name that's on your badge. And my signature, okay. But if you want me to write something else, um, almost anything is acceptable. I will write it on the book. Uh, if you want to donate it to someone else under a different name, for example, I want to talk about the difference between programmable money and institutional money. This came from. Uh, I don't really prepare my talks. I kind of they kind of ad hoc and improvise. But this came from a tweet I received this morning. Someone said, "You know, um, there's a lot of talk." among those who are opposed to Bitcoin, about the fact that it has irreversible transactions, and how that is a major weakness of the system, irreversible transactions. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And the reason it's interesting is because it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what we're doing here, and what this technology is really about. Because irreversible transactions to point that out as a problem in Bitcoin is to take one of Bitcoin's biggest strengths and to, and to think it's a weakness. Because you know, one of the funny things that happens with Bitcoin is that it gives us a hard core of trust, the decentralized trust model. And that trust is hard. And from that hard core of trust, you can extend and create guarantees, guarantees of performance, verifiability, um, security, 
and in the case of transactions, irreversibility. Irreversibility is a feature that derives directly from the hard core of trust. And if you think about it as programmable money, then you realize from this hard core of trust, you can then add layers of innovation that soften that guarantee if you want. So as a, as a developer, I think of that, I look at that technology, and I think, well, you know, actually making reversible transactions in Bitcoin isn't difficult. You can simulate it very, very easily. So let me give you a simple example. You could use a, a multi-sig transaction between a buyer and a seller, and then have that transaction pre-sign a payment to the seller with an end lock time delayed guarantee. So you do automated escrow. Money goes into escrow for 30 days, 14 days. What do, what do credit cards do as chargeback? Pick a number, right? You can do a delayed transaction. Now the vendor knows, the seller knows that 30 days after they have a pre-signed, guaranteed, verified transaction with an end lock time that can verify it independently. That means that you have the money, and in 30 days it will be theirs. But if something goes wrong with the transaction, you can use a third-party arbitration escrow agent who's holding the third key to dispute that transaction issue a countervailing transaction that double spends the inputs and refund the buyer because the product wasn't delivered the product was faulty so with just a combination of two of the most common technologies uh, in bitcoin and the use of a third party escrow i've taken the hard core promise trust of irreversible transactions and i've softened it programmatically and created a fully reversible automated escrow chargeback capability that offers consumer protection as a software service. Better yet, in this model, the market for arbitration is open to everyone, not just Visa. So you don't have, for example, if you're on the Visa network, you have to do Visa rules for escrow and chargeback and arbitration. If you're on the PayPal network, you have to use PayPal's rules. But on the Bitcoin network, you can pick your own arbitration provider. So now we have programmatically simulated consumer protection with a brand new open market for arbitration services. Plus, I still have the underlying guarantee that in 30 days that lock time transaction will execute and will be verified unless there is a countervailing spend. So I took irreversible transactions to the core, softened it and created reversible transactions. Guess what banks can't do? They can't simulate an irreversible transaction. You can't take a soft and fuzzy infrastructure full of counterparty risk and intermediaries and simulate hard trust. They can't do irreversible. But if you start with irreversible, programming a soft simulated reversible transaction is easy. It's just a matter of adding a layer. So see how what they see as a flaw is actually a great strength, because we're taking a fundamental feature of hard trust, and then we're programming different layers around it. The same thing applies to counterparty and institutional trust. Institutional money is built around a soft layer full of counterparty risks. It can't innovate fast. It can't deliver trusted services, it can't deliver hard, trusted models, and it can't change. The reason it can't change is because in order to change institutional money, you have to orchestrate all of the different layers. It's not just the Visa API, but every single counterparty and intermediary that's in there. The network itself has all the intelligence in the center. Bitcoin is the exact opposite. It offers a very simple, primitive core which has a hard trust model, and then all of the intelligence is pushed to the edge, allowing innovators like the people in this room to create innovation without permission, to add innovation layers at the edge, to implement applications, services, products, financial instruments that redefine the trust model. And to do so, they don't have to ask for anyone's permission. Write and deploy. 
And that is the fundamental difference between programmable money and institutional money. It still strikes me as highly ironic how the people who criticize Bitcoin for some of its greatest strengths have not figured out yet that there is no way in the world they could even begin to simulate these strengths. And yet, we can simulate their mushiness all day long right? in software. Easy peasy. We can implement the things. And they criticize Bitcoin for exhibiting the characteristics of a toddler currency, which is exactly what Bitcoin is. It is only five years old. And already, we are reinventing financial services that took hundreds of years to build on the counterparty model. And we're moving faster and faster as this pace is accelerating. So uh, that's my little spiel based on just a tweet I got this morning. I thought it would be interesting to look at the difference between programmable money and institutional money. Uh, thank you so much for coming.